Uh, welcome back. And um, in case you just joined us, uh, you've missed already a fantastic part of the show, but uh, better late than never because we are still going to have more discussions happen. And uh, just like we said, still going to pick into the next conversation, which around the academic staff union of universities. Let me know for a second. Let me just say the shutdown, like Sharon said, the shutdown of the universities. In the last um, almost seven, eight months now, you've had universities in the country shut down. By extension, if you take it to uh, from 2020, they spend almost two years at home. If you take it to 1999, 16, 16 times in 21 years, it gets more outrageous when you think about the number of years that Nigerian youths have not been able to get into school. Courses that should run four or five years now running for uh, seven, eight years. It reminds me of a joke a lecturer told me some years ago that it's a minimum requirement of four years, maximum plus X years. The X stands for years that ASU or SANO or the rest of them will go on strike. The effects on the economy is huge, and we're going to talk about this now with Kalu Aja. Kalu Aja is a financial education instructor. Great to have you join us uh, this morning on News Hub. How are you doing? Good morning. Hope you can hear me clearly. Excellent. Excellent. It's massive. I mean, if you bring out the calculator and try to, try to find out just how much this country is losing uh, because undergraduates are not in school, it's huge. But give us an, an, an overview. Um, and we'll, we'll, love you, we'll love you to speak up because it appears you're a bit uh, far from the device, but give us an overview, an opening rather, on what you think about the economic implications of, um, of the strike. Uh, Kalu, if you're there, please go ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> Let me put it this way. Um, every time ASU goes on strike, what it means is that parents have got to have an alternative. The most common alternative now in Nigeria is for parents to send their kids abroad. So that means that you've got to take Naira and buy US dollars to school in Ghana or Canada or the UK. So look at it this way, for every time ASU goes on strike, the Naira loses value. Jobs are exported out of Nigeria and productivity and wealth of Nigerians go down. So that's just a direct correlation, just one of the main direct correlations between the ASU strike and how it affects you day to day, even without you knowing. Education is a big spend in Nigeria, and ASU strike is contributing to that spend being in dollars, not in Naira. All right. Um, and so if we take it down to uh, the entire process of the education sector, the running of the education sector on a very good day where there is no strike action, where, uh, you know, curriculum, uh, curricula, so to speak, are run as they should be, school calendar not disrupted. Uh, in terms of financial implication for the university, the tertiary education in the country, what have you been able to come up with as regards to the losses recorded so far? I mean, it's incalculable. Um, let's talk big picture, right? There is no country that you can have the GDP per capita grow without an investment in education. So there's none. If you don't invest in education, especially tertiary education, where you could build the skills for the, for the economy, then you can't grow your GDP per capita. So if you look at the, the infographics all over the place, and I like you've done your intro, the amount of money and the amount of strikes in Nigeria is a direct detriment to the growth of Nigeria per capita, GDP per capita. And you really can't measure how much we're losing in terms of the schools closing, the lack of trade happening within the school campus, selling of food, or selling of educational material, teachers not having funds to spend to consume, all these students at home having to then spend from the budgets of their parents. It's incalculable. I, I get the point of ASU, but at this point right now, there's more damage being done to the overall economy than just the university system. Right, it's massive. And, and, and interestingly, if you think about um, how we even got to this point, that um, the federal government had um, in 2009 said let's have a look at the universities all across the country and find out just how much it will be to fix it because it has become unbearable and they came up to a 1.3 trillion naira 
supposed to pay six, uh, two, 200 yeah. billion naira in six tranches. I guess you know the rest, they say. Uh, this administration hasn't paid up to uh, more than 60 b 66 billion naira in seven years. So, on the one hand, wh while we while you think about the 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 state of the universities, that whether ASU can go ahead and still have lectures in those universities, but you're not going to get the money in because the governor of Central Bank uh, the other day was saying we've got close to three trillion dollars. So, sorry, yeah, uh, close close to three trillion naira rather. Uh, in dollars, which is being used by Nigerians to study abroad. They are not going to bring that money into the decrepit universities in any way, uh, Kalu. Yeah. So, so let's go, since you mentioned that agreement, let's talk about that agreement. The 2009 agreement was 1.5 trillion. This was 2009, 1.5 trillion. Like you said, over three years, the government did not do anything. I think they gave them 200 billion and that was it. That agreement, in my view, is no longer workable. I don't see a government spending 1.5 trillion of today's monies today for education. ASU is asking for 25% of the budget to go to education and 50% of that 25% to go just tertiary education. I'm not sure that can happen again. I'm not sure that can happen. So we might have to go back to that 2009 agreement and the government will say, this is what we can do. I'm not defending the government, but the government is broke, technically. I mean, right now we are borrowing to pay interest, right? I don't see where the government's gonna get 1.9 trillion at 2009 exchange rate to give to ASU or to anyone. So we're in a quagmire, right? We've got to like, look at this like adults and be like, what can we do now? Students are at home. How can we get them back to school, right? Strikes cannot be the only option going forward. That's just my, my point. Carl, I'm, 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 I'm wondering, you know, because if a, lot of, a lot of the critics here say, you know, in 2014, when we are at the peak of the Boko Haram crisis, the Jonathan administration borrowed a billion dollars to deal with that crisis. Now you're faced with an economic cri uh, education crisis where the dividends of investing in education, like you've mentioned, far outweigh how much they're putting in. You know, they say, for example, look at uh, the tech giants, the Microsoft. I mean, they put money in their, in their tertiary education yeah. system and it's worth trillions of dollars for them now. So what is wrong in getting a billion dollars in debt, in loan or credit facility to pay for the universities? We've borrowed too much, right? So right now we are borrowing to pay interest. The amount of money we are paying just on the interest is more than the revenues that we're getting. Good luck was able to borrow because we had a lot of capacity to borrow, right? But right now the revenues to uh, debt, the debt, exceed, the debt service exceeds revenue. So there's no chance to borrow. China has stopped borrowing to Nigeria, right? So our options are limited. Instead of borrowing, I, I'm recommending to ASU, let's try endowments where we can say we want to borrow, we want to get the, the private sector to donate to the universities and they get a tax credit in return. You know, I, I saw a guy, an alumni of, I think, yeah. he gave a million dollars to the medical school there are many like him that would give it us a pathway, like a tax credit, where they could donate on endowments set up by the universities that was segregated and the investors could invest it. That to me is a more realistic path to go. Or the central bank would print this money for the universities and would have inflation all over Nigeria. But there really is nowhere to go borrow again. China is oh. not borrowing to us. Dollar rates are going up and all that, so. All right. Uh, why we are not particularly saying that it, this is going to be the only option, another option you've provided now, seems very good, uh, looking for endowment where well-meaning Nigerians, corporate bodies could come together and donate to ensure that this crisis is over. However, these, these people can't be compelled to do it. And whereas they're not forthcoming as well as to, up to the extent, that will solve the situation, we may still be caught up in this impasse. So in that, in that regard, if that is what happens, 
Uh, would you now say that the children should keep staying back at home and government still saying that they can't borrow? And we also heard that there will still be some borrowings to be done if those reports are anything to go mm. by. So what are you looking forward to in this situation so that we can bring our children first and foremost back to school and then we, we don't lose all of the lecturers who we, we, we heard. And many of them are leaving the country in droves. True, true. I mean, great question. And the way to do it is to have a tax credit. So you're going to say, for instance, take Inosin. Inosin wants to build a mechanical laboratory. They could do that in a university. And whatever they spend becomes a tax credit that is transferable. They could pay customs duty with that tax credit. So that way, if he invests in a school, he can pay customs duty or pay FIRS or corporate income tax with that donation like a tax credit. So instead of compelling, you are incentivizing the organized public sector or private sector to invest in education in Nigeria. That's one way to do it. The reality right now, and I, and I, and I know many people is as is listening, the reality right now is that no government is going to agree to give 50% of education budget to just the tertiary um, part of the, of the economy, of the education um, network. Remember, primary and secondary are right there, and there is no nation, I checked it up, no nation in the developed world that spends more on tertiary than primary and secondary. UNICEF says when you spend more in tertiary than primary and secondary, it's regressive. So I hope ASU listens to that and we can meet ourselves halfway. The government has not done its part. ASU is legally right to ask for what it's asking for, but we've got to meet ourselves in the middle so these kids can get back to school. That's what we're all asking for. All right, Carlos. So people wondering whether, whether we're giving the government a hall pass here because you think about it, if you look at those numbers, uh, just the other day we had the International Youth Day and we we're looking at um, how many Nigerians don't even get into primary school. You got uh, 2.5 million Nigerian children who don't get into primary school. UNICEF tells us that the remainder 5.5 million of those children, half of them don't get into secondary school. And only 1.6 million eventually we see right jam. Only 600,000 of them eventually get admission to university. Now they're all at home. So when you think of those numbers and you think about the dire situation yeah. we're in, and the endowment fund, fund, which looks fantastic, or education tax uh, fund, but in the countries where this is done, the, the deficit is way, way lower compared to where we are as a country. We've got massive deficits, and, and I don't know if you know the correlation between the education and the employment and the economic improvement of, as a nation, but. Uh, people are saying that we just have to get those universities where they should be so that we can get this country's industrial wheel started. And the government has a massive role to play in this one. I agree with you completely. I mean, your data is on point, right? And like I said, there is no nation that can grow GDP without an investment in education. The reality is this. The government has mismanaged the wealth of the nation, right? Right now, crude oil is $90, $100, but revenues to Nigeria have declined because production has declined. That's the reality. The government, whatever we might say, they might buy jeeps for this country or frivolously spend on other issues. There really is no money right now. And I wish I could get the government to spend, but I would pursue a strategy for ASU to go after the three main contenders that want to be president. No, but, but, but and Carlos, I'm saying, what is the plan for education? I'm going to put you back on the point. You, you say there's no money, but you know, the other day we had the head of the uh, Technical Education Board come in here. He said 200 billion naira hmm, was used to clean up the dirty yeah. fuel. In this, in this year, the first quarter of this year, 200 billion naira. And it, it hasn't been disputed by anyone. So it's, I, I think that if you help us answer the question, what exactly is priority? If you have 200 billion naira to clean up dirty fuel, but don't have 200 billion naira to put down for education, which will yield for us trillions of naira, even more dollars, in the next maybe five, 10 years, what's the priority for us as a nation? Education, healthcare, the, 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 the human infrastructure, to my view, is priority. But I'm a realist, right? I looked at the, the half year 2022 report by the Ministry of Finance. The figures you're quoting are NNPC, right? 
for the federal government, the federal government budget right now, they are spending more on debt servicing than they are getting in revenues. We're spending four trillion to import PMS. That's right now. So I agree with you that we should focus on human infrastructure, but the reality on our front of us is that the federal government has mismanaged the balance sheet and are paying more to service the debt than to invest in human capital. That's the reality. So we have to move on from that reality and say, what can we do? Hence, we have to go after endowments, give the private sector a tax credit. Don't force them. Incentivize folks to give. If you give, get a tax credit, and then you can invest in universities. Otherwise, we're going to be here. Next six months, they'll be under strike. ASU has been striking since the 1980s. They are still striking. Are you worried as a parent? I want to imagine if you don't, maybe a friend of yours or a friend to a friend has children in school, been out of school. Uh, if you want to look at anyone who's been in school the last four years, most have lost two sessions. And um, these yeah. young people, a devil's, uh, uh, there is a saying that an idle hand is a devil's workshop. So many workshops that the devil can really occupy the space so wide for him at this point in time. Uh, if it will seem as if what you thought would be the solution isn't forthcoming as we see it now, what do you think ASU should be doing? And what should the government do if what you said earlier on isn't working so that these children can go back to class? Yeah. So two questions there, right? Let me just give you an idea. Right now, the only folks in government universities are the children of Nigerians that can't afford to go abroad or go to a private university. That's a big, big shame. That's an indictment on the government that they've reduced the public universities to such a level that you only go there if you cannot afford a private university or to go abroad. That's a big, big, big shame to the giants of Africa. What should ASU do right now? ASU has got to be real. We have a government leaving, say in February. Do we really think that this government is going to come back and renegotiate an agreement that would put an obligation on them to pay about 200 billion immediately? ASU is asking for 1.5. This is 2019 Naira. If you add inflation to that amount, it's going to be in the trillions. So is it not better just to say, let's bring the, the students back in. Let's start negotiations now with all the political parties that are going to be the leading contenders for 2023 presidency. How will you fund education? Give us the bullet point. How will you do it? A, B, C, D. Bring the kids back now. It's not their fault that the government has mismanaged the economy. Let's think about those kids. I, I completely agree with you guys. We, we can't keep kids at home, right? It's not serving any purpose. Also, I heard a new, on, the, on the Twitter, Asu said two years is not too much for children to sacrifice. The children have done their part. They've gone to school. That's their part. We shouldn't put them into this fight between Asu and the federal. So, all right, I'm Carlo, and, and um, I'm sure a lot of, a lot of children uh, are thinking the same way too. But, you, you know, the other day we had um, the phone lines and we asked people to call in and give us um, a, a description because we're on the other side. So we sort of get really concerned when people graduate from school and they get into the industry and they're not fit for purpose. Yeah. And we wanted to get an idea of how the universities were. And you're talking about the so-called Ivy League schools in this country, University of Ibadan or Bafi Mawolo University. And if, if you, to say I was appalled at the state of the universities is an understatement. And interestingly, we had callers who, who were in universities um, in the 60s, 70s, all the way till 20, and you'd not believe it was the same universities they were in. So on the one hand, while people want them to go back to school, others are very concerned about the current state of the Nigerian university today, that it cannot meet where we should be headed to as a nation in the 21st century. Yeah. So let me, let me help you. Let, let, let me put some positive spin on this, right? I saw a report <clears throat> by IFC Group, and they talked about the amount, the, the number of programmers in Africa. 
Number one was South Africa. Number two was Nigeria. But the curious thing about Nigeria was that the Nigerians, half of them were trained by themselves. They went online and they read skills on IT. They basically were self-taught. They didn't go through university. And this is happening now across Nigeria. Many youths are like abandoning the formal education, universities, and are doing self-skill, self-learning, to, to, to get a job, really, to get something to do and to earn a living. And I think that ASU strike and the federal government's inability to kick to an agreement that they signed is going to accelerate this. Don't be surprised you open up the university and no one comes. So it's a big problem. We have to, we have to pull this back. It, 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 we can't let this go on. You know, I hear ASU, I hear the federal government. This can't go on forever. We have to have a situation where these kids are back in school and they are funded immediately with even a token of what ASU is asking for. And then we have a plan to meet ASU and the tertiary, not just the tertiary, education in Nigeria. You know, primary education right now is, in my view, more important than tertiary. You have 10 million kids on the streets, larger than the population of Belgium. We've got to make sure those 10 million kids are educated and do not go out and become a bigger burden to society down the line. Very important point. With you at this point in time, we thank you for being part of the show. We'll take a very short break. When we come back, I'd like for you to answer the question on the image that the incessant strike action in the tertiary education sector in Nigeria would have on the larger society, especially when we go outside the country, the, the quality of the certificates that are issued to our students, how they're viewed. You answer the question after this time out. Do stay with us. With the rise in cases of kidnapping, banditry, court clashes, bombings, and other acts of terror, it seems the current state of insecurity is relatively higher than ever before. Insecurity affects us all. It affects everything from our personal freedom, how we travel, from the cost of goods and services, to even our physical and mental health. Therefore, we have a duty to help security agencies protect us better wherever and whenever we can. If you see or hear something suspicious in your neighborhood, don't keep it to yourself, but be sure to say something to the right authorities. Remember, you could just be saving a life and that life you saved could be yours. This is a message from the Silverbird Group. Thanks for staying with us on News Hub. We're taking a look at the way through which you can end the ongoing ASU strike and also uh, take a look at the economic implication it's been having on the nation as at a larger scale. We've been speaking with Kalu Ajay, financial education instructor. Once again, Kalu, so nice to have you with us on News Hub. Thank you. All right, so before the break, I was asking. Uh, if you've ever put into consideration the effect of uh, the, the mindset, the reputation 
uh, that is going before the Nigerian tertiary education system of always embarking on strike action and then casting doubts on the quality of graduates being churned out. Does it bother you in any way? Yeah, it does. I mean, uh, everyone, if you want to get a job today, you have to write, quote unquote, jam all over again if you're a university graduate from Nigeria. If you want to get a visa to immigrate to the UK, the UK's first language is English, Nigeria's language is English, they still make you write a test of English as a foreign language to graduate. This is all because no one trusts the quality of graduates from a Nigerian public university. That's a big problem. There is no way you can learn if your school is shut down half of the year. If a, if a guy joined the university in Nigeria in 2019, he would have spent more time on strike than in school. That's a big problem. That's, that's not learning. That's no way you can learn in three weeks what you should learn in three semesters. So the quality is going to keep on going down and down. This is why strikes, in a way, then have a diminishing effect, right? The diminishing effect is now kicking in. I've told you more strikes mean the Naira loses value and the quality of graduates keeps on going down. Not just the quality of graduates, the quality of lecturers. There are so many teachers that are leaving Nigeria to go to Canada and taking the, all that useful experience with them out of the country. So you might not have students and you definitely will not have lecturers that were there before the strike. So it's a huge problem. The government is just not doing enough in my view. They're just leaving this to fester, to wait it out as it were. And the, the society is just gonna suffer for this inattitude, I, I think, yeah. Right, and um, it's, it's, also, it's also interesting to think about how uh, this connects to all this. I mean, just this morning, I'll read on the front pages of the dailies, the numbers of uh, automobile plants left in the country uh, still function, and even not even at full oh. capacity, five out of 64. And you ought to be thinking about the number of engineers, for example, who should have jobs in these spaces, but now have been squeezed out of whatever available opportunity they have. How, how, does, how do you view a weak tertiary education system, so not just universities now, the techni te technical colleges of education, all of that. How do, you, how do you see the economic implication of a weak tertiary institution not being able to meet our local production or processing demands? Yeah, low productivity is the answer. When was the last time you heard that a local company used research from a Nigerian university to improve a service or to improve a product it's almost you don't ever hear of it right because there's not much research happening in this citadels of learning the the, the fintech guys that are now you know creating these unicorns that we hear about how many were actually in school in university how many folks that they employ got a bsc degree and are using a bsc degree to get that job in that unicorn like i told you the ifc report says the bulk of Nigeria's IT uh, base is self-taught. So there is no connection with the universities in Nigeria and the companies hiring them in terms of research. The companies hire them and then retrain them. They teach them all over again. I, when I was in university, sad to say, when I did computer science, we were drawing a computer. I didn't see a computer in my university, right? And I heard they were using Fortran and Contrain. Those languages are no longer in existence. You know, BSc computer science in most universities, if you pulled up the curriculum, you would be shocked what they are still teaching in BSc computer science. And you relate that to what maybe a FinTech, say a bank that is online would need from the Nigerian university. So big disconnect. If a Tesla car goes bad in Nigeria, can an electrical engineering graduate from the Ivy League University in Nigeria, can he fix that Tesla car? Because it's all electronics now. So that cut is the lack of productivity. We don't see the research flowing from the Nigerian universities to the manufacturing, because by now we have invented a way to make power, say from sunlight, if, if, since we're in Nigeria, but we don't see all that. It's all imported and all that kind of stuff. So, good call. 
All right, Kalu Ajay, education, uh, financial education instructor. We thank you so much for your time and thoughts on this hub today. You're very welcome. Thank you. All right, you're still watching News Hub. We thank you for making our time to be with us on the program today. We take another break. When we come back, we'll be taking a look at that topic that seems to have been staying with us since 2014, insecurity after this timeout. Don't go away. <laughs> 